Ladies and gentlemen, before centering our attention on the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives new exhibition, we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homeland we gather, including the Nacochtank, Anacostan, and Piscataway people. We also recognize the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here today. And now it is my honor to open the celebration of Nature of the Book, the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives new exhibition in the Natural Mu National Museum of Natural History. Is the book a man-made product or a natural object? Both is the right answer, of course. Even though we may think about the book as one of the most human products of civilization, we also can detect nature directly in all physical parts of it. The Smithsonian Libraries and Archives new exhibition, Nature of the Book, resolves this seeming contradiction in an enlightening way. Acquainting us with early book production processes that includes paper making, typesetting, etching, hand coloring, book binding, and wool tooling. Nature of the book introduces the natural materials books were made from by hands of humans from ancient times to about 1850. These traditional methods are not only stories of the past, they are still practiced today by bookbinders, conservators, book art, artists, and artisans. The book as an object might be looked at as a simple container of human messages and knowledge. Throughout centuries, however, it has developed a vast array of physical features, illustrations, typography, binding, to say just a few, that not only help convey, but expressly embellish the textual content in various ways. What we see in a book is more than what we read in it. We can't miss also seeing the reflection of the skill, experience, and expertise of those whose artisanship materially perfected this medium. It takes almost a village to create a book, especially in the era of handcrafted volumes, publishing involved numerous people using different tools and materials the paper maker, the typesetter, the printer, the illustrator, and the bookbinder are only the commonly known members of the cast. The nature of the book exhibition gives us glimpses into the workshops of these craftsmen and women working in historical times or recent years. The lead role in the exhibition, nonetheless, was given to the natural materials used in those workshops. What were the sources for manufacturing paper? What were the ingredients of inks and pigments? What kind of materials were used to hold the book pages together? These aspects of bookmaking and the assorted parts of bindings required handling a surprisingly large number of various natural resources, actually around 65 different kinds of animal, vegetable, and mineral-based materials as described in the exhibition. Identifying these materials in most cases requires expert knowledge and cutting edge technologies. Being well-versed in chemistry and biology, 
as well as in the history of book production and the art of the book are equally important prerequisites for creating an exhibition about this topic. The Smithsonian Libraries and Archives is fortunate to have had a large group of specialists who collaborated on mounting this unique exhibition with the lead of two co-curators, Katie Wagner and Vanessa Haight Smith. Vanessa Haight Smith joined the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives in 2006 as a book conservator where she treats special collections and prepares materials for exhibition within the libraries and archives for the Smithsonian at large and also for outside institutions. She served as head of the preservation department for 12 years and is an adjunct professor at Catholic University teaching preservation studies to graduate students. Starting her career as a painting conservator, later Vanessa turned to the book to book conservation at the Princeton University Library, where she prepared over 100 rare book exhibitions. She holds a BA degree in painting and art history from Washington College, a postgraduate diploma in conservation of library materials from West Dean College in Chichester, England, and an MA in conservation studies from the University of Sussex. An artist at heart, Vanessa paints portraits and landscapes in her free time. She has crossed the Atlantic more than 42 times and, if quizzed, can name all the presidents of the United States. Katie Wagner is a senior book conservator in the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, working primarily with rare books. She holds a BA in history from Mount Holyoke College and a Master of Library Science degree from the University of Maryland. She is a professional associate with the American Institute for Conservation and a National Heritage Responder. Being passionate about disaster preparedness and emergency response, Katie has served as a founding member of the Smithsonian's Collections Emergencies Team. She is a former co-chair of the American Institute for Conservation Emergency Committee and was member of the steering committee for the DC Alliance for Response. She has represented the Smithsonian on disaster response outreach trips to Haiti, Peru, the Bahamas, and the US Virgin Islands. Katie works day and night. She owns and manages Moonlight Bindery in Alexandria and although she special, specializes in researching leather bindings, she also creates book covers using Lego pieces. In tonight's virtual tour, Katie and Vanessa will guide us through the new exhibition, complementing it as a bonus for all of us with materials that ended up on the cutting floor of the installation. I first hand the virtual mic to Katie. Thank you, Lilo. <clears throat> Vanessa and I always also want to acknowledge Ali Alvis, who is with us tonight in the audience. She formulated the original idea for this exhibition before leaving the Smithsonian. So welcome everyone. To orient you, the exhibition is located on the ground floor of the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. 
When you enter the museum from the Constitution Avenue entrance, the two exhibition cases are straight back past the information booth on your left and right. The display in the smaller case highlights one book that encompasses many of the themes of the exhibition, while the larger case provides space for us to explore those themes in depth using examples from our collections. Now we'll take you on a tour of items included in the exhibition, as well as some items that didn't make it into the exhibition due to space constraints. We originally envisioned the exhibition in three parts, animal, vegetable, and mineral, highlighting products derived from these three categories, their use in book production. As well, as we explored these categories, we realized that overarching themes of economy and trade offer deeper insights into the choices of materials available to printers and bookbinders. Trade, both globally and locally, shaped the basic elements of a book from the technology of paper making introduced from the East to the types of leather available to bind the book, including animal hides brought from the African continent. The raw ingredients for pigments used in manuscript illumination and for hand colored illustrations were also sourced, sourced both locally and globally. For example, azurite, a copper based pigment was sourced from France and Germany while cochineal, an insect based pigment was imported from Mexico. The themes of luxury and thrift are evident in the selection of natural materials used to print and bind a book. Local resources played a part as craftspeople sought affordable materials available closer to home. Violet Wright, Levitt's Easy Lessons in Reading, is a small, plain, practical volume common in post-colonial America. We are not sure if it was originally bound with local sheepskin scraps or later mended, but this modest patchwork binding displays a frugal pragmatism. Precious minerals or transported great distances to create pigments, or in the case of the volume on the left, Wine, Women, and Song, to ornately decorate book covers known as jeweled bindings. This example features cabochon cut amethyst clustered to resemble bunches of grapes. During the time period when this book, Wine, Women, and Song, was bound, the amethysts were most likely sourced from Brazil. Thanks, Katie. The 400 years that are highlighted between the 15th and the 19th centuries may seem like a long time, but the practices and technologies we're dis discussing evolved slowly in the pre-industrial world. And during this period, the organization of the bookbinding trade moved gradually toward its modern form. Some important changes did occur during this time. The practice of writing on parchment was eventually replaced with printing on paper revolutionized by the development of movable lead type in the 15th century. You can see the illustration of early typesetting on the left. As a result, more books were printed and bound. In turn, the development of printing and the growing availability of paper helped to increase literacy throughout the world, creating the need for larger scale book production for a wider audience. Books moved from valuable objects reserved for churches and for the wealthy to having far broader uses, providing general religious texts, music, novels, and school books. Books were more portable, lighter weight, and often cheaper materials were necessary to satisfy the growing demand. Book binders relied on local resources to manage economic pressures. And as populations moved, so did local industry. The book you see in the center is another early American primer, frugally employing very thin sheets of locally sourced wood for the covers. This was less expensive than importing other covering materials from abroad. On the far right, an 18th century English calfskin book cover was given a boost by simply using natural acids and water to make decorative patterns. The book also evolved as the availability of natural resources shifted with new discoveries through exploration and changing fashions. This increasingly connected world, made possible in part through exploration and colonization, offered imported natural materials to a population enlightened by reading and education. And now part of this virtual tour and taking advantage of this format in the presentation, I'd now like to offer a special feature that just isn't possible to be placed within the exhibition. 
It's a step-by-step -step introduction to creating a typical yet very basic 17th century European leather covered book. From start to finish, it sheds light on the surprising network of trades and skills and labor involved of what for many is a familiar object. As you watch this, consider that before the printing press, books were produced by the thousands. And by the 17th century, the number was in the millions, all handmade. Sheets of paper seen on the upper left were made by hand, and in this case without printing, which is another step that would have been completed in another workshop. But this is a model, so we're working with blank sheets. Decorated marble paper in the center is completed by a marbler. With these, the bookbinder would fold all the sheets into separate sections using a tool made of animal bone. The folded marbled paper sheets would be placed at the front and back of the stack of papers. The gathered sheets is now called a text block, receives holes at the folds seen at the bottom left. The sections are gathered by sewing with linen threads through these holes anchored around cords on a sewing frame. The sewn text block is cut from the frame and the spine is covered with glue made from animal hides. The cut cords are frayed and the spine is rounded. The image at the lower right shows the spine covered with paper and this would often be from leftover scraps found in the bindery. End bands are attached to the head and tail or top and bottom of the book spine. These are silk threads that are wrapped around a core. And in this model, that core is a piece of leftover parchment that's been dampened and twisted. At the lower left, the book covers known as pasteboard are literally that. Many layers of handmade paper are pasted together to create stiff boards. And when dried, the finished boards are cut to the size of the text block and a double set of holes are created on the edge where they'll be attached to the spine. You can see on the bottom right, the image that uh, show the frayed cords that are laced through these holes. And now the book is starting to take shape. The two top images show the cords trimmed from the outside and how they look from the inside laced through. The next photo on the lower left is the leather from the tannery. It's dyed dark brown on the skin side and the image in the center shows it paired with blades on the flesh side. The lower right image is the finished dyed leather dampened and ready for covering the text block. The dampened leather now covers the book and you can see the raised cords on the spine. The leather is then tied down around the cords. And since the leather is wet, it's placed under weight so there's no distortion when drying. The images along the bottom show the turned in leather of the front and back covers after the leather's dried. The leather is neatly trimmed and those sheets of folded marbled paper that we saw earlier are pasted down. When you see decorative papers now at the front and back of old books, you'll now know what's underneath. Here's the finished book, the front cover and below it standing upright. The image on the right is the same model, but cut away to show the layers. And this cutaway is included in the exhibition. Now you can see the folded sheets, the sewing around the cords, the end bands, the animal glue, the paper lining, and the leather covering. This exhibition contains references to the very same parts of the book as we've just seen, and you'll discover more about their sources and variations during this tour. Thank you, Vanessa. The exhibition begins in the smaller case, highlighting a work from the Coleman Library. Mark Catesby's 18th century masterpiece, The Natural History of Carolina, Florida, and the Bahama Islands. It is the only known contemporaneous record of the natural history of the American colonies. 
It's a fascinating combination of frugality and luxury that enables us to explore these themes in the exhibition. It was published in London between 1729 and 1747. The reason it was released over such a long period is because Catesby self-financed the work. Printing it in 11 pre-subscribed parts over 19 years allowed him to do this. To further reduce his expenses, the hand-colored illustrations, such as the middle image of a blue linnet, were etched and initially even colored by hand by Catesby. He learned the craft of etching by hiring the artist Joseph, Joseph Gopi as his instructor. Of the estimated 200 copies produced, each is unique. Our copy is an excellent example of the labor involved to create this book. If you consider all the elements in the volume, leather, paper for the text, and the marbled end sheets, printing, hand coloring, and gold tooling, combined effort involved considerable time and labor by merchants, craftsmen, and tradespeople across several countries. The visible evidence studied through scientific and bibliographic research reveals how and why these variations in choices and materials occurred. Catesby's work is printed on thick, high quality paper. Like most European papers at the time, it is made of, a, of heavily processed and beaten linen rags. Many of the papers are identifiable by watermarks, which are images woven into metal screens used as molds in the paper making process. The slide on the right is a paper mold in use by one of the contemporary artists featured in the first case. The watermarks are visible when a light source is placed behind the sheets of paper as seen in the left two images. Unique watermarks can be used to identify the paper maker and the geographic location of their workshop. Many different papers were used in this volume because of the length of time it took to publish all the parts. The watermark on the left with the page rotated to make the watermark legible is from Jean Villadre, a French paper maker. In the hand press era, books were generally sold unbound with the owner specifying the materials for the binding at the time of purchase. We know that this copy of Catesby's work was owned by Cromwell Mortimer, secretary of the Royal Society. Catesby included instructions to subscribers asking them to wait for the release of all the parts before covering uh, and having the volume bound. Cromwell Mortimer filed these instructions waiting 18 plus years, almost 19, to have the entire work bound at one time. Examination of the binding strongly suggests that Mortimer chose to bind his copy in Russia leather a close-up of which is seen on the right. Russia leather was a luxury item imported to England by the Baltic trade routes. It is identified by its rich reddish brown tone and cross-hatched texture. The use of this leather indicates the wealth of its owner who not only chose the finest covering material, but also chose to have the covers elaborately gold tooled with the family crest as seen in the middle slide. Much of what we know about this book is credited to the extensive research of Smithsonian Natural History rare book curator, Leslie Overstreet. Marbling, um, this is fun. The decorative marbled end papers in the case we volume on the left have a design created by drawing a comb through a bath of colors floating on the surface of water thickened by carrageenan moss, which is a seaweed. Carrageenan is depicted in the illustration in the middle slide. And on the right, you see another one of the contemporary artists in, featured in the case, creating the marble paper by dragging that, chrome, that, that comb through the pigment floating on the water. As I mentioned before, um, we we're featuring some contemporary artists. The background panel of this case highlights artists practicing skills such as etching, gold tooling, marbling, paper making, and printing, emphasizing that although the bookmaking process today is largely industrial, these skills are still practiced today by artists, book artists, and fine binders. Now we will move to the second larger case that explores many of these themes on a larger scale. <clears throat> we can glean significant information from the materials chosen to bind a book. They give us insight into where the coverings originated geographically, the owner's wealth and status, and even why they were made. In this slide, we see three very different leathers from left to right, an alum Todd pig, a Morocco leather, which is goat, and calf on the right. The leather used <clears throat> varied regionally with pig skin used more often in Germany and Northern Europe. For the wealthy, imported leather from Russia or Morocco was an option as a binding material. Calf skin is the most commonly used leather, leather for book binding in this period. And as Vanessa mentioned earlier, this calf skin is also decorated 
by treating it with water and chemicals to create this pattern. The level of decoration on the cover, such as blind tooling seen on the left-hand side or uh, gold tooling seen in the center slide and the use of marbled paper and other decorative end papers gives us further insight into the status of the owners. The format of each book can suggest the choices, needs, and taste of the owner. A smaller book, small enough to hold in the hand, might be a book of devotion, while a large folio necessitating a desk to properly examine might be a book of reference. Remember that each book was made by hand and the covering materials were individually selected to reflect fashion and utility with decisions driven by a variety of materials available to bookbinders. Another indication of a high-end binding is gold tooling. In this process, gold leaf is adhered to leather using egg white as an adhesive, then stamped using a heated brass decorative tool. You can see the process on the right from one of our contemporary artists and an example of elaborate gold tooling from Wine, Women and Song. These are the doublures or leather end papers that will actually not be shown in the exhibit. We'll only be showing the cover. So this is a peek into something we're not able to show during the exhibition. Bringing in the theme of global trade, gold tooling was introduced to Europe from the Middle East via Italy. By the 16th century, it had spread throughout the continent to become the predominant form of high-end book decor decoration. Recycling is another compelling theme in this exhibition. Parchment pages made from the hides of sheep, goats, and calves in medieval manuscripts were later recycled for use as book covers, as seen in the image on the left. Scraps of parchment in the middle image were also used to make glue. The knots in the parchment were used to tie the edges of the parchment to a frame to dry. This piece is what, remain, is what remains after the dried parchment is cut from the frame. The practice of recycling paper was also common in Japan. Like uh, the volume on the right is a Japanese book from the National Museum of Asian Art Library. It's uh, traditionally covered in paper, but during the Edo period, Growing literature, literacy encouraged bookbinders to seek economical solutions to meet increased production. One method of achieving this was to layer sheets of poor quality paper with a finer final covering sheet made of a higher quality dyed embossed paper. Returning to parchment pages, this is another volume featured in the exhibition. And I should point out to you that we have five rotations during the 16 months of the exhibition. So if you return periodically, you will see different books, will rotate different books out. So even when worn or incomplete, a parchment manuscript was still valuable. Producing parchment was expensive and time consuming. As a result, parchment pages from a worn or damaged manuscript were recycled for other uses. In this example, a sheet of parchment is repurposed as a book cover. A close up of the second column of the manuscript with the illuminated N is on the right. As discussed, an important thread woven through the exhibition is the use of natural materials made available through trade routes. The Arab conquests in particular created routes that stretched from Asia to Europe, providing ideas and materials for Europeans that changed and improved the craft of bookbinding. There are two book covers shown here, on the left, an Islamic binding, and in the center, an Italian binding, which illustrates the influence not only of imported leathers, but the fashion of gold tooling that moved into Europe. Another introduction was silk, a natural fiber from the cocoon of the mulberry silkworm, and used in both Asian and Western books. It was used for decorative end bands, as we saw in the book model, and also here on the right, it's used to sew a text block of a Japanese book. This global market of ideas and costly products inspired the creation of lavish bindings. However, tradesmen could adapt by using their own available local resources. A primary example of changing technologies is flax-based paper. So paper as we know it was produced as early as the first century in China, where sheets were created directly from plant fibers of the paper mulberry tree, seen dried at the left. As the craft moved west along with goods traded by Arab merchants, materials for paper making eventually shifted by the 13th century. 
Changing two was the use of direct plant material to the practice of recycling used fabrics and textiles woven from flax. The stems of this adaptable flax plant shown in the center illustration provided fibers for textiles that were torn up and pulped to produce sheets of flexible and printable paper. And some of you may be familiar with the term rag paper. Fibers were also spun into sewing threads and the oils from the seeds were used in recipes for printer's ink. Adopting these methods and materials that were introduced, Italian paper makers created some of the highest quality linen rag paper by the 15th century. The illustration on the right in the exhibition is printed on Fabriano paper, still vibrant after 600 years. And this is just one example how a single ingredient, flax, contributed to the design of the book that we recognize today. However, the paper story doesn't end there. Cotton eventually surpassed linen as the primary source for paper. And that's because the cotton economy, economy was fueled by the work of enslaved people in the American South, along with the invention of the cotton gin and improved plant hybrids. It created a competitive market for British export. And as a result, cotton use dominated fashions and styles of woven fabrics and discarded cotton cloth rags were sent to paper mills and this contributed to a shift in paper content by 1800. The continued use of rags encouraged a search for less expensive sources for paper. The page shown at the left is from Jacob Christian Schaefer's book that includes studies in experimental paper content. This is a sample of paper made from moss and one of the many kinds of paper made from a variety of plant sources featured in this volume. Another page from this book from a completely different source and on display in the exhibition leads to one of the more unusual intersections with the natural world. Wasp nests were an unlikely inspiration for paper making. However, an 18th century French entomologist studied the wasp's habits of chewing up wood fiber, mixing it with saliva and creating the pulp for their nests. The center illustration of the nests is also from the same book by Schaefer, as is a page made from the nests themselves. This ingenious observation influenced Schaefer and others whose aim was to move away from the centuries old practice of using recycled rags and return to natural plant sources. This eventually led to the era of wood pulp paper or paper made from trees. The text in the Matthias Koops book on the right states that it's printed on paper made from wood alone. And this is probably the first known instance of bleach wood pulp paper in English book production. This shift in paper making to less expensive wood pulp coincided with the end of the hand press era in favor of large scale industrialized printing. Thank you, Vanessa. Now I'm gonna take you away from book production to discuss the unique challenges of creating an exhibition during the pandemic. The creation of an exhibition is a three-year process. We were still in the initial planning stages when the pandemic hit. Staff were not permitted to work on site and access to our collections was very limited. Administrative permission was needed if collection visit was necessary and multi-person visits were prohibited. So the curatorial team could not enter a collection together and each visit was limited just a few hours. We prepared for each scheduled visit by researching records in the Smithsonian Library's online catalog as well as by accessing cover to cover images from the Biodiversity Heritage Library or BHL. Seen at left is the BHL site that we use to select the illustrations from Mark Catesby's work to highlight in the exhibition. The program man manager Kirsten Vanderveen's vast knowledge of our special collections, as well as the painstaking review of years of conservation treatment documentation undertaken in our book conservation lab proved to be valuable resources for selection. An example of a photo from a conservation treatment report used to locate an image of cochineal is on the right. For every rare book that enters our conservation lab, a report with photo documentation detailing the condition of the volume before, during, and after treatment is required. With months of effort and determination, 
we created a narrative that served as the foundation for the exhibition. Thanks, Katie. The shift and development of paper also made it easier for pigments and inks to be used for illustrations and text. Extracted from a variety of colorful natural sources, pigments have been ground into powders and mixed with binders made with simple ingredients like tree sap or egg yolk. So they flow on the page hand colored with a brush. Pigments come from clays, minerals, plants, and even surprisingly, insects. Some colors are directly harvested from basic ingredients used since prehistoric times, such as earth pigments like yellow and red ochres and brown umbers, seen here in an early illustration on mineralogy at the left. Other colors are results of intervention, such as burning wood or bone to produce the basis for black printing inks, seen in the center. And the ancient practice of exposing copper to acids creates the bright green color verdigris illustrated by the butterfly at the right. Pigments became an essential ingredient for the growing number of titles in the hand press era. The range of books included illustrated scientific works, encyclopedias, atlases, and studies in color and art. And we need to remember this was before photography and colored illustrations were the only source for reference. And those marbled paper end sheets required bright colors for their decoration too. Japanese books on display in the exhibition employ painted covers using silvery mica, confirmed by conservation scientists at the National Museum of Asian Art. The mica specimen on the right is on loan from the Natural History Museum's Department of Mineral Science. Trade and economy aided in shifting resources for colors. By the 18th century, indigo cultivation and production cornered the market for blue organic dyes and was also used on the Japanese book cover on the left. The tiny insect cochineal shown in the illustration at the right was a source of a deep red pigment importing, imported to Europe by the Spanish conquest of Central and South America. The center image is an illustration from a 17th century Spanish manuscript. The red color used has been identified as cochineal. Also understanding the use of Prussian blue, the first of the modern pigments developed around 1705, helps to accurately date the use of colors. We know this because Catesby used this blue to color his illustrations later that century. And we know that Catesby used this color because of the remarkable network of scientists at the Smithsonian. Scientific labs at the National Museum of Asian Art, the Museum Conservation Institute, and the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum use analytical techniques like X-ray fluorescence or XRF that can provide detailed information invisible to the naked eye. XRF is a non-invasive method that enables us to determine the chemical components of pigments by measuring their fluorescence or radiation on the surface of the page. You can see the area of the wing in Catesby's Carolina parrot on the left that was examined by material scientist Gwinnell Cavage using XRF seen in the photograph on the right. The results showed iron content, suggesting a mixture of Prussian blue and yellow ochre to produce the green color. Using this method, we've revealed mineral-based reds and blues and greens, yellows and earthy browns among the illustrations used in the exhibition. Those colors made from organic materials such as plants required further testing. It's all been educational and actually pretty fascinating. The use of cochineal mentioned earlier was confirmed by Smithsonian physical scientist Asher Newsom and a visiting research fellow, Hannah Lawther. Luckily for us, they were some of the very few staff permitted to work on site during the pandemic. So working on a hunch based on the date and location, which was early 17th century Spain, I suspected that the red pigment used in the manuscript might be derived from cochineal. 
Asher and Anna were interested in testing the manuscript, and I was able to carry it to their lab where the color was analyzed using a liquid microjunction surface sampling system. This means a droplet sample the size of a head of a pin touches the surface of the parchment for exactly one second and is then transferred to a mass spectrometer for analysis. While the process is virtually undetectable, Hannah cautiously took 11 samples from different pages of the book that already had existing water damage. These samples were chosen as indicative of the red color throughout the manuscript that demonstrated the likelihood of cochineal being used. We also had to prepare ourselves for another possible outcome. Understanding that there were alternative organic pigments to cochineal used during the 17th century, closest to this was matter root, any analysis completed had to be able to detect this as well. To prepare, Hannah made samples of both types of organic pigments from scratch. And this meant not only finding cochineal beetles, but crushing them into a powder. And she tested the prepared pigments in the weeks before my arrival. On that day of testing of the 11 samples taken, nine showed adequate levels of cochineal. Surprisingly, recurring themes in the exhibit also included pollution and poisons. We did not have space in the exhibit for the theme of pollution, but plan to explore it further through blog posts and social media engagement like this presentation. For centuries, tanning leather, glue production, and extracting minerals through mining generated waste and pollution. Part of the leather tanning process shown in this image, in the pre-industrial world, the production of leather polluted waterways, so tanneries were located outside of city walls and downstream due to the odor of the tanning process and the wastewater it produced. Thanks, Erin. Metals used in book production, such as gold and copper, also had toxic properties or extraction methods. Mining for gold releases mercury and cyanide into the environment, endangering ecosystems. Copper, used for book printing and illustration since the 1400s, has been extracted from the earth and used in numerous applications since prehistoric times. The extraction process can release toxins, including mercury, lead, arsenic, asbestos, and cadmium. The term natural does not necessarily mean safe. In the pursuit of beauty, craftsmen and artisans unknowingly relied on poisonous ingredients. Through examination, research, and chance, we have discovered the hidden toxins in some of the natural materials that have been historically used for coloring, dyeing, and printing. Processing natural ingredients can have unfavorable outcomes as well. Pigments of varying colors contain toxins such as lead, mercury, and cadmium. In the red family, red lead or minium was manufactured by heating lead oxide. Great care is to be taken as accidentally inhaling the dry pigment causes lead poisoning. The pigment fell out of favor due to its toxicity and difficulty in mixing it with other colors. The jar at the right contains the pigment red lead and you'll see the skull and crossbones on the original packaging. The orange color in the illustration at left from Suro Nososhi was confirmed via XRF to be red lead by scientists at the National Museum of Asian Art. These books, a set of Emmerling's Lehrbuch der Mineralogie, were published in Germany in 1799. The bright green color decorating book edges was tested using XRF and the results show high levels of arsenic and copper that may be attributed to the presence of copper arsenite pigment known as Sheila's green. Invented in 1775, it's an irresistibly bright color that was also used in textiles and wallpaper. Chances are high that they were bound close to the date of printing. However, we cannot be certain. The present, presence of emerald green, also called Schweinfurt green, cannot be entirely ruled out it is a, was first synthesized in 1814. This is an example of the occasional difficulty in making curatorial decisions in order to convey information as accurately as possible within the limited space of an exhibition label. As a result, we rely on the opportunity to discuss this in greater detail through social media and public programming. Verdigris is a striking bright blue green pigment made from the crystals that form on the surface of copper when exposed to acids such as vinegar. The pigment has long been known for its corrosive nature. However, it has been widely used since antiquity throughout Asia, the Middle East and Europe. 
We often treat verdigree damaged paper in the conservation lab. As the pigment degrades, it darkens and sinks into the paper, staining the reverse side of the page and even adjoining pages. Over time, it becomes brittle, causing the paper to crack. Another cor corrosive is iron gall ink, which was the standard manuscript ink used in Europe for almost 1500 years. It contains oak galls, which are the uh, small round tree growths created by the larval development of the gall wasp, seen in the foreground of the photo on the right. Other ingredients in iron gall ink include iron sulfate, drawn from iron rich spring water and sap from acacia trees. And it as well corrodes through paper. This exhibition is just a glimpse of the world during the hand press era. It gives visitors an opportunity to examine the important moment where the intersection of culture, technology, economics, and craft supported the knowledge of natural materials that were used to create the book. We hope you have the opportunity to visit in person the exhibition runs through March 17th of 2024. And we wanna thank a variety of people listed on the next two slides, um, people who made this exhibition possible and there are so many, I will not read them all out, but we thank each and every one of you. And we are happy to take some questions. I see some in the chat. Thank you so much, Katie and Vanessa, for that great tour that uh, really went across hundreds of years and around the globe um, to, to highlight some of the amazing things all the way around the book, not just the words that are inside of it. So thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and start moderating some uh, questions. I know that we have a few already. And just as a reminder, um, please do use that Q&A button if you have questions for our speakers, please. So <clears throat> the first question um, is, what is the earliest book in this exhibit? Does it also include papyrus scrolls and codices, for example, or does it start with what we think of as a modern book? Uh, Katie, I, I can say um, the, the dates we selected for the exhibition is the hand press era, which is 1450 to 1850, uh, because we just simply didn't have the room. Uh, to discuss a book binding history. Um, so the earliest book I'm uh, thinking, that's a very good question. Um, maybe the Don Felipe or, or the Aristotle. Maybe the Aristotle. Yeah. It's 15, 1508. Yeah. Don Felipe is 1603. I believe it's a, uh, it's a, a book using wood boards, uh, likely bound in Southwest Germany. Yeah, the Aristotle is older than the Don Felipe. Yeah. And it's in Leela's collection. <laughs> and it's on display now. Yeah. I know that we had um, a previous question that Katie uh, answered aptly in the Q&A feature about whether all of the books in the exhibition are from our collections. And proudly, they are. Yes, they are. We, yeah. did, we, did not, we did not borrow any books from this exhibit. We relied on the 21 branches. Um, we don't have things from every branch, of course, because these are older materials, mostly from our rare collections. We did borrow uh, from the museums, from entomology. We have a wasp's nest, we have minerals, um, we have lead type, we have Japanese printing block and tools. So we borrowed from other Smithsonian museums too. Great. Um, another question from Nicole. Do modern book conservators typically try to use original materials when performing restoration, or do they seek out modern alternatives due to ethical reasons, scarcity, or hazardous materials? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we try to use, um, we try to maintain and retain as much of the original components of the book um, and we have to keep in mind, this is a working object. So uh, in some cases, restoration may be necessary, meaning we have to use something else in order to keep it working that may not have um, made it possible. It might have been a part of the book that impeded its movement. So it had to be replaced with something else. But no two books are alike, um, and it um, makes it a challenging and interesting um, vocation <laughs> for that reason. Thank you. Katie, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Nope, I totally agree. <laughs> okay. 
Um, how to use store books that have toxic elements that were used in their production. Well, with the, Where are we putting that arsenic book? Yeah, the arsenic books, we, we have created housing boxes, double tray boxes for them. And we have labeled the boxes with warning labels. And we do ask that researchers use gloves. You saw our mount maker, Willow, using nitrog gloves while she was handling that book. It really doesn't pose a lot of danger unless you ingested the material. However, better safe than sorry. <laughs> Um, and on a related note with the arsenic, um, wondering if that's the same toxic green used in Victorian wallpapers that resort, resulted in air poisoning from the yeah. practice of closing windows at night. Yes, it was used in textiles and wallpapers. And there's a famous book, The Walls of Death, which is examples of that wallpaper. We do not have a copy, sadly. Is there information in the exhibition about the organization of the 16th century job case? This is the drawer in which metal type would have been organized as a in a print shop. No, it's not in the exhibition. Um, I, I sound like a broken record and I will sound like a broken record in that we just had limited space to cover uh, in the physical exhibition. And as Katie mentioned, it gives us an opportunity to use other platforms like social media, public programming, um, webinars such as this to branch out in more detail about topics like that. Thank you. We have a couple of questions about um, book conservation work. How do you as trained conservators find your interdisciplinary background affects your curation? And how much, for example, how much scientific background do you assume in your audience? And are the SI conservation labs all connected? multi-part question. Um, no, the conservation labs are not all connected. Um, what were the other parts of the question? Was it a scientific lab you were at that was being asked or the conservation labs? Or the scientific labs are also not all connected that we mentioned. Uh, MCI does have a concentration of scientists, but there are other labs, scientific labs around the Smithsonian. There is not just one. And there also there's more than one conservation lab as well. So I guess the question is how much, um, also how much does your scientific background inform the curation of this exhibit and how much scientific background do you assume that the audience has? That's a tricky question. Um, we have some scientific background. Uh, I, I think we consider, I'm gonna speak for Katie a bit. I think we consider ourselves a bit more craft-based in the discipline of conservation that we practice with some scientific knowledge. And this is why working at the Smithsonian is so rewarding, is that there is a village, as Leela put it, of um, colleagues that can assist us with that information and helped enormously with research. Um, there were areas that were opened up to me that I, I didn't really realize. I, I had some notion, but I knew where to ask the questions. Um, that helped with curation on my part. Absolutely, and I, I can't thank, uh, you know, we consulted with the collections manager for the bivalve department, for the entomology department, and, you know, they had the specific knowledge needed to include the correct materials in this exhibition. We, we did not have that. My background is history and art history, and we, we don't have a lot of art books in this, so um, we did rely on a lot of outside help. A lot of help from our friends and colleagues. Um, we have a couple of questions about whether there'll be a book about this exhibition and if there's a complete list of all of the books that are featured in the exhibition. And I will go ahead and answer that we are working on a companion website for the exhibition. Um, unfortunately, we don't have we don't have a book in the, the process right now, but um, you should be able to see an in-depth look at um, all of the, the images that you've seen through this um, presentation and a lot of the um, material on our website in hopefully a few weeks. We are we are planning, um, Aaron can speak to this, uh, public programming throughout the year that include uh, guest speakers, lectures, and we would like to hold hands-on workshops for some of the crafts uh, described uh, in the exhibition. So please keep an eye out for that as well. Yes, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and a fun question: what it, it was? What was that goat-looking thing on your question slide? I know you guys love that image. 
I'm trying to remember. It was a sheep. Oh. Unicorn. It was a while ago. We were looking. This was during the pandemic, and I was alone in the Coleman Library looking through books, and I came across that image. And I sadly I can't remember. <laughs> I'm sure Kirsten's listening and on the edge of her seat and able to answer, but I I can't recall. I bet we can find it in the Biodiversity Heritage Library yes, and share we, it with folks. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, a question about XRF. You referenced a lot of individual pigments, but how do the analytical tools like the XRF deal with colors that are made up of a mix of pigments? And does that confuse the readout? The readout will tell you basically what, uh, what the mineral-based paints are, are, are included. If they're organic, you're not gonna get a reading. If there's a mixture, you just don't know. If there's if there's not a, a level of iron or mercury or lead or calcium, if there's nothing there, it's gonna indicate that there's uh, an organic pigment used. If there's an organic pigment used, there's not um, a, a real way to indicate uh, that specifically. And I don't know if I answered the question, but it really can, it's going to tell you one type of pigment but the information, the reading won't be there for organic pigments. Thank you. Um, we have two questions about resources, uh, books that you can recommend about the history of bookmaking um, and book binding. Any, any of your favorite books that you'd like to recommend? We uh, have one question about that from a, a grown up standpoint and one for middle grade students. I think Katie and I will agree on the Cockrell book. Mm -hmm. Douglas Cockrell. Mm -hmm. yeah from the beginning, you know, the turn of the last century. And I, I think it's really um, still referred by bookbinders and conservators. Is it bookbinding in the, um, what's the title? Bookbinding book in, in the care of books. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> um, Thank you. But I think from that's from an adult standpoint. Katie, what about middle? more challenging for children I would say there's a lot of there are some shit like little children books about books but that the middle school age is a little bit trickier um yeah I'd have to think put my thinking cap on and, and <laughs> get back to you on that <laughs> well we're just about out of time but I'm gonna uh, end with a, a a pretty fun question hopefully you can answer it pretty quickly in your opinion what is the grossest thing you've come across used in book my bookmaking there are some artist books in our collection that have things like dead flies um, incorporated into them. And that's, I don't know, Vanessa, how do you, what have you seen? Uh, dead flies on purpose? I've seen dead flies on dead accident. Flies on purpose so too. We have both, you know. There are a number of technicians that have worked with us that um, have to remove dried animal glue. And in order to do that, you have to get it wet and it smells like a wet dog and uh, they've protested. And once it's removed and you have this big goop of wet, old hide glue, it's pretty unfun. It's, pretty not, it's not pleasant. It also smells awful. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. I'm not. sure. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have today. Um, you will be receiving a follow-up email with a link to this recording, as well as some of the links that I've shared in the chat. And we'll also have a post-event survey link for you to take. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you to Leela. Thank you very much to Katie and Vanessa. And we'll see you again for our next program. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.